Iron Mountain, a now closed ski resort in California, stands out as one of the most iconic lost ski areas in the United States, boasting a captivating story of its rise and ultimate decline. Once a vibrant fixture in California's skiing community, it has sadly dwindled into a mere shadow of its former self, marred by extensive vandalism. In this video, we'll embark on a journey through the complete history of Iron Mountain, exploring its numerous ownerships, multiple closures, and ultimately, its final shutdown. With the introduction out of the way, let's now delve into the complex history of Iron Mountain. There are essentially four different iterations of the ski resort, commonly known now as Iron Mountain, each with different names. The first iteration of the ski area was Silver Basin. In April of 1970, local resident John Allen announced the development of the Silver Basin Ski Resort. Located 46 miles east of Jackson, and with a 7,200-foot vertical drop, Silver Basin was initially constructed with one SLI double and one Palma lift. As part of the development, a two-story base lodge, ski shop, dormitories, a dining room, and a ski patrol building were constructed. Interestingly, a 10-acre snow play area was also developed. By January of 1971, Silver Basin was officially open, with the timber chair servicing quite a few terrain options. That summer, John Allen installed a second SLI double, servicing the beginner terrain, replacing a rope tow. Unfortunately for John Allen, Silver Basin wouldn't last long. After running into financial difficulties in early 1974, Allen claimed that the Bank of Stockton promised to loan him refinancing and operating funds as long as Allen gave them a blanket deed of trust on his land. Allen did this, but the bank reportedly did not lend him the money, leaving Allen in a bind. Because the land was in a deed of trust, no other bank would loan him the money he needed. Interestingly, Allen claimed that the bank had a stake at the Kirkwood Ski Resort and thus had conspired to put him out of business. Whether this is true or not, I'm not really sure. But what I do know is that Silver Basin was no more after this point. The ski area sat dormant from 1974 until 1977 when the second iteration, Ski Sundown, was formed. The land was bought by two local residents in 1976 who sold everything to a local company titled Crowder Development Company. By January of 1978, Ski Sundown was operational and had drawn up plans to install two new chairlifts, servicing intermediate and advanced terrain. According to the resort, it was crucial that Ski Sundown expand or the business would not survive. In 1978, Ski Sundown installed two new riblet lifts, now known as Eagle's Nest and Wildcat. Additionally, the resort repaired and opened the motel, whose roof had partly collapsed in 1975. In 1979, the Crowder Development Company sold the resort to a group titled Pacific Western Ski Resorts Incorporated. Despite the new ownership and new lifts, Ski Sundown closed in early 1980. There were several reasons for the closure, most notably the drought years of the late 1970s, which brought little natural snow and created variable openings. Another reason for the closure was the lack of marketing the ski resort did. With Kirkwood down the road, Sundown struggled to make a name of itself. In 1983, Richard Scott purchased all assets of the ski resort and announced a reopening under the name Iron Mountain for the 1983 to 1984 ski season. The ski resort opened with the identical footprint and operation of Ski Sundown, just under new ownership. In the summer of 1984, Iron Mountain installed the Bruin Triple Chair, finally bringing reliably open advanced terrain to the resort. Throughout its life, Iron Mountain suffered from being in the shadow of Kirkwood. While Kirkwood was a household name, Iron Mountain struggled to gain a market share, struggling to attract either families or expert skiers to the resort. In 1986, Iron Mountain was abruptly shuttered after the operator was unable to cover the minimum insurance amount. Iron Mountain stayed closed for three years until it reopened in 1989 under new ownership. Under the new owner, Iron Mountain hired a marketing firm and actually started to prosper. The new owner purchased used chairlifts and drew up expansion plans which were in the review process by the U.S. Forest Service. Unfortunately, the new owner didn't want to wait for the Forest Service approval for this expansion and started clearing trees. In the summer of 1991, after a flyover of Iron Mountain, the Forest Service discovered the unauthorized logging, prompting them to shut the resort down and arrest the owner. Iron Mountain sat abandoned from 1991 to 1994. This brings us to the final iteration of Iron Mountain. 
In 1994, the resort was purchased by a New Zealand-based operator who purchased all assets and renamed the resort to Carson Skiria. The new operator had a greater focus on the terrain parks and planned to construct a superpipe. During the process of recertifying the chairlifts, a huge snowstorm hit. Because all the lifts weren't ready, the operator was only able to open limited terrain on three chairlifts. While Carson Skiria operated from 1994 to 1995, the operating company went bankrupt after the season and closed the resort permanently. The Forest Service revoked the special use operating permit in 1998. In 2000, a new group seeked to revive the Skiria under a new name and branding. Unfortunately, the Forest Service seeked to remove Iron Mountain from its winter sports site designation, which the land had had since 1970. The new group claims that all Iron Mountain needed was an infusion of cash and a solid business plan. Unfortunately, the Forest Service was just done with Iron Mountain at this point, quoting, We've been through bankruptcy so many times, we said never again, no more. We don't want to deal with it. We don't have the people, the time, or the money to sink into this bottomless pit that Iron Mountain is. On October 1st, 2000, the Forest Service reaffirmed their decision to delist Iron Mountain from a winter sports site, effectively removing any hope of the ski area operating again. As part of the decision, the Forest Service stated that the operation of the ski area at Iron Mountain will not be economically viable in the long term solely based on the physical characteristics and potential market. This conclusion would remain the same regardless of the quality of the management or financial backing. Since this decision, Iron Mountain has not changed much. Every year, the remaining ski lifts and structures continue to deteriorate further and further. Now, to break down the topography of Iron Mountain, I've brought in someone who is better suited to discuss the ski area than I. Take this away, Ben. Thank you, Skier72. Iron Mountain was built on a north-facing slope, had a vertical rise of about 1,200 vertical feet and roughly 1,700 acres of skiable terrain. Being an upside-down ski area, most of the runs were located below the lodge which sat at about 7,000 feet, though the true summit was located above. With no ski runs leading directly back, the only option was to ride either the timber, little rabbit, or Bruin lifts to return to the lodge. It featured a wide variety of terrain on the mountain with greens, and mostly blues abundant throughout, though it featured some pretty gnarly cliffs off the Eagle's Nest lift, and a large portion of the black runs were located off the Bruin lift. It had no snowmaking and only primitive grooming equipment. Starting with beginner terrain, most of that could be found off the little rabbit lift, with one run, a cat track, leading down to the bottom of the timber lift. Intermediate terrain is where Iron Mountain thrived, as it made up roughly two-thirds of the resort's skiable footprint, with a fair amount of it being located off the wildcat lift and another large portion found off the timber lift. This area of intermediate terrain was very well thought out, as most of the runs in the area flowed back down to the timber and wildcat lifts in a wide open area that is now overgrown with alder. When it came to a few more advanced blues, those were both found leading back to the bottom of the Eagle's Nest lift, one of which started at the top of that same lift and the other starting at the top of the Wildcat lift and running to the bottom of Eagle's Nest. This was Iron Mountain's longest run at three and a half miles long, descending the resort's entire vertical. Also, when it came to advanced terrain, Iron Mountain had a strong contingent of black runs, most of which were located off of the Bruin lift with some short but steep black diamonds and the gnarliest terrain on the mountain being located underneath the Eagle's Nest in the cliff area. There was also one isolated black run off the Wildcat lift, which featured a rolling fall line that could catch those unfamiliar with the area by surprise. As it came for how the mountain skied, I was only able to experience this from a backcountry standpoint. I skied a lot of the blues off Wildcat and all of them off of Timber. The area they flow into is very nice despite being overgrown with alder and is very convenient as you start in the same area and end in the same area each time. The snow quality was great, the pitch was great, and the topography is nice and fun. I really wish I could have experienced this mountain in its heyday. Had it survived its mid-90s struggles, it would have a very nice niche market for budget-minded families along with the likes of Donner Ski Ranch, Soda Springs, and Tahoe Donner. I truly wished I could have experienced it. Thank you for having me, Skier72. My name is Ben Eminger. We now return to you. Iron Mountain had a hard run. With multiple owners, closures, bankruptcies, and just general issues, I almost can't fault the Forest Service for growing tired of the ski resorts. I do believe that if the Forest Service had given the mountain one more chance, it could have been around today. Ultimately though, it's one of the most unique lost ski resorts in the United States, 
and its history is quite complex. Thanks again to Ben Emager for breaking down the topography of Iron Mountain. Be sure to watch his four-part series in the resort if you want more, and also subscribe to his channel. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to this channel. And until next time, this is Skier72.